you can't kill the rooster. When I was young, my father was transferred, and our, fam our family moved from western New York State to Raleigh, North Carolina. IBM had relocated a great many northerners, and together we made relentless fun of our new neighbors and their pokey, backward way of life. Rumors circulated that the locals ran stills out of their tool sheds and referred to their house cats as good eaten. <laughs> our parents discouraged us from using the titles ma'am or sir when addressing a teacher or a shopkeeper. Tobacco was acceptable in the form of a cigarette, but should any of us experiment with plug or snuff, we would automatically be disinherited. Mountain Dew was forbidden, and our speech was monitored for the slightest hint of a Raleigh accent. Use the word y'all, and before you knew it, you'd find yourself in a haystack, French kissing an underaged goat. <laughs> Along with grits and hush puppies, the abbreviated form of you all was a dangerous step on an insidious path leading straight to the doors of the Baptist church. <laughs> we might not have been the wealthiest people in town, but at least we weren't one of them. Our family remained free of outside influence until 1968 when my mother gave birth to my brother Paul, a North Carolina native who has since grown to become both my father's best ally and worst nightmare. Here was a child who, by the time he had reached the second grade, spoke much like the toothless fishermen casting their nets into the Albemarle Sound. <laughs> this is a grown man who now phones his father to say, Motherfucker, I ain't seen pussy in so long, I throw stones at it. <laughs> my brother's voice, like my own, is high-pitched and girlish. <laughs> Telephone solicitors frequently ask to speak to our husbands or request that we put our mommies on the line. <laughs> the Raleigh accent is soft and beautifully cadenced, but my brother's is a more complex hybrid, informed by his professional relationships with marble mouth, deep country work crews, and his abiding love of hardcore rap music. <laughs> he talks so fast that even his friends have a hard time understanding him. It's like listening to a foreigner and deciphering only shit, motherfucker, bitch, and the single phrase, you can't kill the rooster. <laughs> the rooster is what Paul calls himself when he's feeling threatened. <laughs> Asked how he came up with that name, he says only, certain motherfuckers think they can fuck with my shit, but you can't kill the rooster. You might can fuck them up sometimes, but bitch, nobody kills the motherfucking rooster. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it often seems that my brother and I were raised in two completely different households. He's 11 years younger than I am, and by the time he reached high school, the rest of us had all left home. When I was young, we weren't allowed to say, shut up. But once the rooster hit puberty, it had become <laughs> acceptable to shout, shut your motherfucking hole. <laughs> the drug laws had changed as well. No smoking pot became no smoking pot in the house before it finally petered out to, please don't smoke any more pot in the living room. <laughs> my mother was, for the most part, delighted with my brother and regarded him with the bemused curiosity of a brood hen discovering she had hatched a completely different species. <laughs> I think it was very nice of Paul to give me this vase, she once said, arranging a bouquet of wild flowers into this skull-shaped bong my brother had left <laughs> on the dining room table. It's non-traditional, but that's the rooster's way. <laughs> He's a free spirit, and we're lucky to have him. Like most everyone else in our suburban neighborhood, we were raised to meet a certain standard. My father expected me to attend an Ivy League university where I'd make straight A's, play football, and spend my off hours strumming guitar with the student jazz combo. My inability to throw a football was exceeded only by my inability to master the guitar. My grades were average at best, and eventually I learned to live with my father's disappointment. Fortunately, there were six of us children, and it was easy to get lost in the crowd. My sisters and I managed to sneak beneath the wire of his expectations, but we were worried about my brother, who was seen as the family's last hope. From the age of ten, Paul was being dressed in Brooks Brothers suits and tiny clip-on rep ties. 
He endured trumpet, le trumpet lessons, soccer camps, church-sponsored basketball tournaments, and after-school sessions with well-meaning tutors who would politely change the subject when asked about the rooster's chances of getting into Princeton. <laughs> Fast and well-coordinated, Paul enjoyed sports, but not enough to take them seriously. School failed to interest him on any level, and the neighbors were greatly relieved when he finally retired his trumpet. His response to our father's impossible and endless demands has, over time, become something of a mantra. Short and sweet, re repeated at a fever pitch, it goes simply, fuck it. Or, on one of his more articulate days, fuck it, motherfucker, that shit don't mean fuck to me. <laughs> My brother politely mams and serves all strangers, but refers to friends and family, his father included, as either bitch or motherfucker. <laughs> friends are appalled at the way he speaks to his only remaining parent. The two of them once visited my sister Amy and me in New York, and we celebrated with the dinner party. When my father complained about his aching feet, the rooster set down his two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew and removed a fistful of prime rib from his mouth, saying, Bitch, you need to have them ugly-ass bunions shaved down is what you need to do, but you can't do shit about it tonight, so lie not, motherfucker. <laughs> All eyes went to my father, who chuckled, saying only, I guess you have a point. A stranger might reasonably interpret my brother's language as a lack of respect and view my father's response as a form of shameful surrender. This, though, would be missing the subtle beauty of their relationship. My father is a type who once recited a body limerick saying, A woman I know who's quite blunt had a bear trap installed in, oh, you know. <laughs> it's a base vernacular term for the vagina. <clears throat> He can absolutely kill a joke. <laughs> when pushed to his limits, this is a man who shouts fudge, a man who curses drivers with a shake of his fist and a hearty, GDU. <laughs> I've never known him to swear, yet he and my brother seem to have found a common language that excludes the rest of us. The two of them are unapologetically blunt. It's a quality my father admires so much he's able to ignore the foul language completely. That, Paul, he says, now there's a guy who knows how to communicate. When words fail him, the rooster has been known to communicate with his fists, which, though quick and solid, are no larger than a couple of tangerines. At five foot four, he's shorter than I am, stocky but not exactly intimidating. The year he turned 30, we celebrated Christmas at the home of my older sister, Lisa. Paul arrived a few hours late with scraped palms and a black eye. There had been some encounter at a bar, but the details were sketchy. Some motherfucker told me to get the fuck out of his motherfucking face. I said, fuck off, fuck face. <laughs> then what? <laughs> then he turned back and I reached up and punched him on the back of his motherfucking neck. <laughs> what happened next? What the fuck you think happened next, bitch? I ran like hell and the motherfucker caught up with me in the motherfucking parking lot. He's all beefy, all flexed up and shit. And the motherfucker had a taste for blood and he just pummeled my ass. <laughs> when did he stop? My brother tapped his finger type tips against the tabletop for a few moments before saying, I'm guessing he stopped when he was fucking finished. <laughs> the physical pain had passed, but it bothered Paul that his face was all lopsided and shit for the fucking holidays. <laughs> That said, he retreated to the bathroom with my sister Amy's makeup kit and returned to the table with two black eyes, <laughs> the second drawn on with mascara. This seemed to please him, and he wore his matching bruises for the rest of the evening. Did you get a load of that fake black eye, my father asked. That guy ought to do makeup for the movies. I'm telling you, the kid's a real artist. <laughs> Unlike the rest of us, the rooster has always enjoyed our father's support and encouragement. With the dream of college officially dead and buried, he sent my brother to technical school, hoping he might develop an interest in computers. Three weeks into the semester, Paul dropped out, and my father, convinced that his son's lawn mowing skills bordered on genius, set him up in the landscaping business. I've seen him in action, and what he does is establish a pattern and really tackle it. <laughs> Eventually, my brother fell into the floor sanding business. It's hard work, but he enjoys the satisfaction that comes with the well-finished rec room. 
He thoughtfully called his company Silly P's Hardwood Floors. Silly P being the name he would have chosen were he a rap star. <laughs> when my father suggested that the word silly might frighten away some of the upper tier customers, Paul considered changing the name to Silly Fucking P's Hardwood Floors. <laughs> The work puts him in contact with plumbers and carpenters from such towns as Bunn and Clayton, men who offer dating advice such as, if she's old enough to bleed, she's old enough to breed. <laughs> old enough to what, my father asked? Oh, Paul, those aren't the sorts of people you need to be associating with. What are you doing with hayseeds like that? The goal is to better yourself. Meet some intellectuals. Read a book. After all these years, our father has never understood that we, his children, tend to gravitate towards the very people he spent his life warning us about. Most of us have left town, but my brother remains in Raleigh. He was there when our mother died and still, continu and still years later, continues to help our father grieve. The past is gone, hoss. What you need now is some motherfucking pussy. <laughs> While my sisters and I offer our sympathy long distance, Paul is the one who arrives at our father's house on Thanksgiving Day, offering to prepare traditional Greek dishes to the best of his ability. It is a fact that he once made a tray of spanakopita using Pam rather than melted butter. Still, though, at least he tries. When a hurricane damaged my father's house, my brother rushed over with a gas grill, three coolers full of beer, and an enormous fuck it bucket a plastic pail filled with jawbreakers and bite-sized candy bars. When shit brings you down, just say fuck it and eat yourself some motherfucking candy. <laughs> there was no electricity for close to a week. The yard was practically cleared of trees and rain fell through the dozens of holes punched into the roof. It was a difficult time, but the two of them stuck it out. My brother placing his small, scarred hand on my father's shoulder to say, bitch, I'm here to tell you that it's going to be all right. We'll get through this shit, motherfucker. Just you wait. <clears throat>